All right, second passage. Let's read the blurb. Passage one is adapted from Milton Friedman and Rose Friedman, Free to Choose, 1980 by Milton Friedman and Rose Friedman. Passage two is adapted from Douglas J. Amy, Government is Good, 2011, Douglas J. Amy. So the first paragraph starts off by saying in the first sentence, an essential part of economic freedom is freedom to choose how to use our income, how much to spend here and there. In line five, then it says, currently more than 40% of our income is disposed of on our behalf by the government at federal, state, and local levels combined. So yeah, he's probably talking about um, taxation. You can kind of guess that he doesn't really like that because of the way he starts off the paragraph. The next part of the paragraph, he introduces this idea of a new national holiday, Personal Independence Day, and he defines it as that day in the year when we stop working to pay the expenses of government and start working to pay for the items we severally and individually choose in light of our own needs and desires. So at first I was kind of confused by what he meant by that because, you know, if you're working a job and then you get your paycheck, that, that 40% of your money is already kind of taken out. But he's not thinking paycheck to paycheck. He's thinking about all the money that you make in one whole year. And if he says that 40% of your income is taken by the government, then that means the first 40% of the year is when you're essentially working for the government. And then the next 60% of the year is when the money that you make actually starts going to yourself. So that's why he's able to say in 1929, that holiday would have come in Abraham Lincoln's birthday, February 21st, because I guess presumably back in 29, the amount of money that they lost to taxes was significantly lower. If it's February 12th, that's a little more than 1 12th. Um, today it would come to about May 30th, which makes sense because May is the fifth month of the year. So if you're saying from January to May, five out of 12 months, you're working for the government, that matches with 40%. And then the rest of the year from uh, June to December, that money goes back to you. And then he says, he's making a prediction. If present trends were to continue, it would, con it would coincide with the other Independence Day, July 4th, around 1988. So he's predicting that the amount of money that people are giving to the government is going to keep going up. And if it's July 4th, that's just past the halfway mark. So he's saying by 1988, we'll probably be giving about 50% of our income to the government. In the next paragraph, he's going to talk about how we get to this situation. So line 20, it says, we participate in the political process that has resulted in a government spending equal to more than 40% of our income. So he's saying that we're partially responsible. And the way that that happens is through, in line 23, it says, majority rule. He calls it a necessary and desirable expedient. However, what he's going to do is he's going to compare majority rule to going out and buying things in the supermarket. From that comparison, he's going to point out a few things about how majority rule works. So what does he say? He says, line 26, when you enter the voting booth once a year, you almost always vote for a package rather than for specific items. So that makes sense because if you're voting for a candidate, you don't really get to decide what that candidate or even that political party is going to do very specifically. You generally just have a choice between a few and you have to go with the whole package. So he says line 28, if you're in the majority, you will at best. So he's basically saying, even if you're in that majority, you'll get both the items that you favored, because that's probably why you voted for that person and the ones that you opposed, but regarded as on balance, less important. So that basically is saying you vote for someone, you probably like a lot of what they're saying. You might not like everything that you're saying, but the parts that you don't like, you probably made the decision that that doesn't weigh as heavily as the parts that you do like. And so you kind of get both the good and the bad that he's saying. And then that's why he says, generally you end up with something different from what you thought you voted for. So I don't know if that sentence is talking about <clears throat> the fact that like people change their positions, politicians, or if it's um, talking about the actual voting process itself, not clear. So regardless, that all counts for the majority. If you're in the minority, it says, you must conform to the majority vote and wait your turn to come. What does that mean? If you're in the minority and your candidate didn't get voted, you have to go with the majority candidate, the one who actually won. That's basically all he's saying. And then he's contrasting that to supermarket in line 34. When you vote daily in the supermarket, you get precisely what you voted for. What does he mean by that? You, you see the item that you want, you pay for it, and that's what you get. 
y in 36. The ballot box produces conformity without unanimity. So what does he mean by conformity? It means that whatever candidate wins, that's going to be the president or the law of the land for the whole country without unanimity. And basically that's because that candidate is going to continue to be in office even though he didn't get 100% of the vote. That's what he means by there's conformity in terms of the results without unanimity in terms of how he got there. In the marketplace, he says, unanimity without conformity. I'm not sure exactly he wants if he exactly wants to say that, but it, you know, regardless, you know, putting these, those two words um, in the opposite direction does make it kind of sound nice. And he says, that's why it's desirable to use the ballot box so far as possible, only for those decisions where conformity is essential. So he is saying that, you know, there, there are decisions where conformity is essential, where the result that you get should apply to everyone. And that kind of makes sense because, you know, you don't, you probably don't want certain laws being different in different parts of the country or, you know, according to different people. So there are some outcomes that he's saying where conformity is essential. So if we're going to uh, annotate our passage, we'll basically say that his first point is about how freedom should lead to freedom in terms of how we use our income. And then he's talking about taxes being 40% too high for him. And then he talks about that holiday. In the second passage, we're talking essentially about voting and majority rule. And then he's making this analogy with voting versus the supermarket and how they're essentially different. And then passage two. So given that the blurb says government is good for the title, you can kind of guess that passage two is going to contrast, at least in some way, to passage one. Let's go paragraph by paragraph and see what it says. She opens up by saying, why are most people in denial about the beneficial roles that government plays in their lives? And then she says, there are several answers first. So the whole passage is going to actually try to attempt to answer this question in different ways. So why are people in denial about how you know the government helps them? She says, first reason, most Americans are used to the benefits of government that they simply have taken them for granted. Mm -hmm. And then she gives exam examples such as clean water, stable currency, uh, people don't think of these as benefits. And then the second reason that she gives starts in line 51. She says, our failure to notice or appreciate what government does for us also has to do with the unique and peculiar nature of many government benefits. What's unique and peculiar about these benefits? She says, number one, they are not immediate in line 55. And number two, they are not particularly tangible, meaning to say they're not concrete. They can be remote and elusive. And then interestingly enough, she also contrasts government benefits with exchanges in the marketplace. And she uses the example of going to the store, you pay for something, you get something concrete in return. And that she says is very satisfying. So we'll just underline going to the store and the marketplace. But she says in line 64, not so with many of the exchanges we have with our governments. In other words, it's not as tangible, not as immediately satisfying. She says line 66, we shell out money, what we get in return is frequently delayed or remote. This is, again, going along with her 2A reason. And then she gives an example, sewage, right? So how does sewage work? It says, when we go fishing or swimming, the water's purity depends on adequate sewage treatment, and we do not see this as a result of our sewer tax. That makes sense. She's saying that because we pay taxes to get rid of sewage, we can go out and enjoy the lake or river, but that's a delayed or remote benefit. And it says, line 74, it's hard to make connections between them and the taxes that we pay. So that's her point about those types of benefits. Next paragraph, she says, government benefits are also different because they are less tangible. So again, this is her second reason and the second part of the second reason. So that's 2B. And then she says more specifically, these benefits take the form not of the presence of something, but of the absence of something. And then she gives examples. What are the absences? We pay taxes so that our homes don't get burgled, like burglarized. Our food doesn't make us sick. Our banks don't fail. Our bridges don't collapse. She's saying that these things all are necessary to have a functioning society are also things that we take for granted and because they're less tangible. Line 85, she kind of sums up. In other words, when people in government are doing their job right, nothing happens. No wonder nobody notices. 
uh, line 89, and then she concludes, this is one of the reasons why we too easily fall for the illusion that government is doing nothing for us. So she's basically just summarizing and wrapping up her point that was made in the first paragraph that, you know, talking about the reasons why most people are in denial about the beneficial roles that government pays. All right, so questions. And it pays to remember for the double passages, the best strategy is read the first passage, do all the questions that have to do with that passage only, then read the second question, uh, second passage, do all the questions for that passage only. Only after you've done that, do the questions that deal with both passages because there's not gonna be a lot of them and they tend to be harder. It also prevents you from getting mixed up between passages as you're answering most of the questions. Number 11, in passage one, the authors repeat 40% line five and 22 in order to, so let's go back and look at how they use 40%. Line five, it says, currently more than 40% of our income is disposed of on behalf by government at federal, state, and local levels combined. Then line 22, it says, or we can start from line 20, we participate in the political process that has resulted in our government spending an amount equal to or more than 40% of our income. Why does he mention 40% twice? Well, he obviously doesn't like it because he doesn't like the idea of having to give away um, that much of his income. So let's see what the answer choices say. A, emphasize a the number they believe is too large. This seems plausible because we know he doesn't like it and we know from that whole discussion about the holiday, the way he phrases it does kind of make it sound like a lot if you think about it on a yearly basis. Choice B, Support a claim they believe many people will doubt. I don't get any indication in the passage that he thinks people are going to doubt this number. Probably whether it's a good amount or not is where the controversy is going to lie. So B, not likely. C, ensure the reader understands how they arrived at their calculations. He doesn't really say how the 40% came about and he doesn't really calculate that himself. So C is kind of off. D, correct a the perception they believe is incorrect. Again, no indication that anyone ever thought that people were paying more or less than 40% in their taxes. So it doesn't seem to be a perception they think is wrong. So D is out and A is the best answer. Question 12, according to passage one, over time, personal independence day would occur later in the year because, so let's go back to the passage. Now keep in mind, this is what I talked about in the passage summary. Personal Independence Day marks that point in which you go from working for the government to the place where you're now working for yourself. Because he's thinking of this 40% that we lose, not paycheck to paycheck, but on a yearly basis. So what that means is that if we're losing 40% of our income, you can say that for the first 40% of the year, it's like we're working for the government, and then the next 60% of the year, we start working for ourselves. And once you cross, cross that threshold, that's Personal Independence Day. So the question is, why is Personal Independence Day gonna be occurring later in the year? We have to look at line 13. He says, in 1929, that holiday would have come on Abraham Lincoln's birthday, February 12th. February 12th is very early in the year. What that means in 1929, they were probably losing a lot less of their money to taxes. You know, February is the second month of the year, so all of January went to the government. That means they lost about one-twelfth, a little more than one-twelfth of their income to the government. And then from February 12th, they start making money for themselves. Today, it comes about May 30th. That makes sense because May is the fifth month of the year. That means five out of 12 months, you're working for the government, which matches up roughly with 40%. And then after May 30th, you start working for yourself. And then it says, if present trends were to continue, it would coincide with the other Independence Day, the real Independence Day, July 4th, around 1988. So by present trends, he probably means that the amount that the government is taking from taxes is continuing to go up. And July 4th is right in the middle of the year. So by 1988, he's predicting that we're going to lose about 50% of our income to taxes. Choice A. People are unaware of how much their income tax, uh, how much of their income goes to taxes each year. The fact that it's occurring later in the year doesn't mean people are unaware. Like we said, it means people are going to be end up losing more of their income. Choice B: People's incomes are not growing as rapidly as they were in the past. That could be true, and then you know you can argue that because they're not growing as rapidly, therefore we're we're not making as much money. But again, a percentage is a fixed amount. So even as your income grows, the amount that you're going to pay to the government is going to be the same percent. That in itself is not going to change the day of this holiday. Choice C, 
people are spending a greater percentage of their income each year on taxes. Yeah, that seems to be what he's saying by moving this holiday forward. So we'll keep it. Choice D. People misunderstand the underlying desires that motivate their spending. Maybe true, but again, nothing to do with personal independence day and what the passage is talking about. So the best answer is choice C. Question 13. According to passage one, one result of the current political process for determining how taxes are spent is that. So keep in mind the political process, you know, where he talks about voting and majority rule. That is in the second paragraph of the first passage. So that's where we'll probably find our answer. So let's go through the answer choices. Choice A. The government has more funds than it needs to operate efficiently. Passage 1 may say that because, again, he's arguing that taxation rates are too high, but there's nothing that's said about that in paragraph 2 where he talks about the um, political process. So he never says that that's a result of the political process. Choice B, the government is unable to secure the public's confidence. Also, nothing really in the passage about that, and it's definitely not a result of that political process that he talks about. Choice C, Voters who are in the majority tend to be highly satisfied. This, I would argue, is a kind of the opposite. He actually says that voters in the majority are only mildly satisfied, if I had to describe it. So let's take a look at where he says that. Right, so you want to start in line 28. It says, if you're in the majority, you will, at best, get both the items you favored and the ones you opposed, but regarded as, on balance, less important. Generally, you end up with something different from what you thought you voted for. So that's basically the majority position. It's sort of like saying you generally get what you wanted, but it's not the ideal situation. To say that that means that they're highly satisfied is definitely off. So C is out. Choice D, voters rarely get exactly what they want. So yeah, that would work from the lines that we just read. And looking back at the passage, that's also true um, not only for the majority vote, but also for the minority vote, which is probably a little bit more obvious. For both people, he says it's different from the supermarket where you get precisely what you voted for. Question 14. The author's remark in 36 to 38 serves two. So let's look at that part. We're in the area where he's comparing voting to the supermarket. 36 starts out by saying the ballot box provides conformity without unanimity. The marketplace, unanimity without conformity. From the passage uh, summary that I did before, we were basically saying the conformity is the fact that whoever the majority votes for, everyone else has to follow. Uh, he's saying there's no unanimity because certain people are going to vo have voted for the one, the person who won, and certain people are going to vote for the have voted for the person who didn't win. So that's the lack of unanimity. In the marketplace, on the other hand, there's obviously no conformity because everyone buys what they want. Whether or not there's unanimity, I, I think is questionable in terms of making his uh, sort of analogy work, but that's just my opinion and that's kind of irrelevant here. But just keep in mind the main points about the ballot box compared to the marketplace. A, the remarks serve to suggest that conformity is more desirable than unanimity. I don't really think he's saying that one is more desirable. If anything, he's saying that you, he prefers unanimity. But I think what he's really saying is that there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off when you vote, and there's a trade-off when you go to the marketplace. And certainly by the end of the passage, he actually does say that sometimes you actually need that, if you remember. He says in line 38, that's why it's desirable to use the ballot box so far as possible, only for those decisions where conformity is essential. Choice B, Caution that unanimity and conformity are incompatible aims. I don't think he's saying that they're incompatible. That's a little bit too extreme. Oh, and that's certainly not the purpose of the remark. The, the purpose of the remark is really to just analyze sort of how voting works compared to how you know shopping in the, the marketplace does. Choice C, point out that the two activities have similar flaws. Not really saying that they have flaws and not really saying that they're similar. So C doesn't really make sense. Choice D, emphasize a sharp contrast between two familiar activities. What are the activities? Voting and shopping. So choice D does seem to work. Question 15, a central idea of passage 2 is that, keep in mind what we talked about in the summary, that the purpose of passage 2 is that she's trying to explain why people don't recognize the beneficial role of government in their lives, and she offers like two to three reasons with a lot of examples. A, people unfairly compare the worth of purchase goods with the worth of government benefits. Nowhere in the passage does she say that people actually do that. 
she herself compared purchase goods with government benefits only to illustrate the point that the purchase goods were more tangible and immediate and people can see their benefit clearly. If you're curious where that was, it was from like 59 to about 63 when she talks about buying stuff in the marketplace. She says, this exchange is very satisfying. We see what we get for our money right away. Choice B, people tend to overlook the connection between paying taxes and receiving some ongoing government benefits. Yeah, this generally does go along with her main points in the passage. Let's go over them real quickly. Her main answers for why people are in denial about the beneficial roles that government plays is number one, that we're so used to the benefits that we take them for granted. Number two, our failure to notice has to do with the unique and peculiar nature. What is the unique and peculiar nature of those benefits? Number one, they're not immediate and they're not particularly tangible. So those are the main points of her passage. So choice B is probably gonna be the answer. Let's look at C and D. C, more people take advantage of government spending today than in the past. I don't think she talks about that anywhere in the passage, uh, comparing today to the past. Choice D, government benefits are more reliable today than they once were. I also don't think she says anything about the reliability and how it's changed over time. So all that means is that choice B is the best answer. Question 16, as used in line 51, appreciate most nearly means. Our failure to notice or appreciate what government does for us also has to do with the unique and peculiar nature of many government benefits. My best guess word for appreciate in this case would be to recognize. It's got to be something that goes along with notice. In other words, our failure to notice or recognize what the government does for us or maybe something like acknowledge. So let's see what the answer choices are. Failure to accumulate what the government does for us doesn't make sense because to accumulate means to build up. Failure to judge what the government does for us is kind of off because, you know, when you judge something, it doesn't imply necessarily good or bad. But I think she really wants to say that we should recognize and appreciate something and maybe even be thankful for it. So B is going to be out. Our failure to value what the government does for us. That one seems like it's going to work and that does go along with appreciate. Last one is our failure to safeguard what the government does for us. Safeguard really means to protect. It doesn't really make sense. She's not trying to say we should protect what the government does for us. She's saying that we should really recognize it, appreciate it, value it. So C is going to be the best choice. Question 17, it can be reasonably inferred that the author of passage two would characterize the tax money spent on road maintenance as providing benefits that are what? Keep in mind what the main arguments of passage two are. She says basically one, that we take a lot of things we get from the government for granted. Two, a lot of the benefits are not immediate and not tangible. So let's look through the answer choices real quick and see if we can zero in on some and eliminate others. Choice A. Easier to understand than most of the benefits taxes provide. Not 100% sure. She may agree with that, you know, when it compared, you know, compared to that example she gave of sewage. I think she's likely to say that road maintenance is going to be neglected or unappreciated. But we'll, we'll hold on to A for now. B. Unlikely to be acknowledged as long as the roads are in good condition. This definitely seems like a possibility because towards the end of the paragraph, she did talk about how when things were going well, that we don't recognize them. Choice C, dedicated to future generations at the expense of current taxpayers. Doesn't really make any sense. She never really talks about how certain benefits go to future generations, but not benefiting the people who actually pay for it. That's a different issue. Choice D, a result of compromise in which no voters are satisfied. That seems to be something that it goes more along with passage one, not passage two. So we'll cross that out. And now we got to move to question 18. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? So keep in mind, we're either looking for evidence that tax money spent on road maintenance is going to be not appreciated or not acknowledged so long as the roads are in good condition, or that they're easier to understand than most of the other benefits. Choice A, 42 to 44. Why are most people in denial about the beneficial roles that government plays in their lives? There are several answers. So these are the questions that the author is asking, but She's not really offering any answers in these lines, so it's not gonna back up either choice A or choice B. Choice B, lines 51 to 54. Our failure to notice or appreciate what government does for us also has to do with the unique and peculiar nature of many government benefits. Not really sure that this is gonna count as good evidence for either A or B, because a road 
is probably not going to fall in this into this category of unique and peculiar nature of the benefit. You know, roads are pretty straightforward. So it's not likely that this is going to back up either of our answers. Choice C, 76 to 78. Government benefits are also different because they're often less tangible than the goods we get from a store. Does that back up either that roads are easier to understand or that roads are un unlikely to be acknowledged? I don't think so because again, a road probably wouldn't count as something that's less tangible. So C is also not likely the answer. Choice D, line 78 to 82. These benefits frequently take the form not of the presence of something, but of the absence of something. Think of it this way. Much of the job of government in our lives is to ensure that bad things don't happen. And then after that, they give examples of homes not getting burglarized, food doesn't make us sick, blah, blah, blah. So would roads fall under that? I think it's reasonable because if the road is doing the job that it should, then it's not going to give you problems. You're not going to see potholes. It's not going to start to crumble. So let's look back at our choices again. So given that line, it seems that B is the best answer. It's unlikely to be acknowledged as long as the roads are in good condition. And that's definitely better than A because they didn't say in lines 70 to 82 that for some reason roads are easier to understand, even though I think that is true. So we're going to go with B and choice D for 17 and 18. Question 19, based on the passages, the authors of passage one and passage two would agree that transactions in the marketplace. All right, so this one's probably gonna be pretty easy. You can do this probably without looking at the passage because you're looking for something that they both agree on. And since pass the two passages are generally in disagreement, it's not gonna be that hard to find something that they agree on, but let's see. Choice A, are often taken for granted by consumers. So the idea of taking things for granted is definitely in passage two, but neither passage one nor passage two say that transactions in the marketplace are often taken for granted. So A, not gonna be the answer. B, our source of satisfaction to customers. This they actually do both say, and I'm gonna show you in a second. So we'll keep that for now. Choice C, should be generating more tax revenue than they do currently. Neither passage talks about how much tax revenue is gotten from the marketplace. Choice D, are too tightly regulated by the government. Neither passage talks about how tightly regulated they are. This is probably just a general opinion, possibly held by people who agree with passage one, but not likely the answer. So let's look for the evidence. Line 34, when you vote daily in the supermarket, you get precisely what you voted for, and so does everyone else. Based on that, we can probably say that it's a source of satisfaction to customers. Passage 2 talks about the marketplace over in 59. When we go to the store, we hand over our money, blah, blah, blah. And then it actually says, line 62, this exchange is very satisfying. We see what we get for our money right away. So both passages are in support of choice B, and that's going to be the answer. The questions 20 and 21 should be done together. So you always want to be reading two questions ahead, just in case it's one of those questions where the following one asks for evidence, in which case this does. It can be reasonably inferred from passage two that Amy, the author, would likely respond to the Freedmen's proposal of a personal independence day by asserting that the Freedmen's, this is asking what would passage two say about passage one in relation to this idea of a personal independence day? Keep in mind, personal independence day was used by passage one as an illustration to really hammer home the point, just how much of the income or our income is going towards taxes. So before we look at the evidence, let's briefly read over the choices, see if we can eliminate ones that are totally off. That'll make our job easier. Choice A, ignore how much people receive from the government in return for their tax dollars. This one definitely seems like a safe answer because the whole point of passage two is to say, why people generally don't appreciate all the benefits from their tax dollars and then they give reasons. Choice B, the Freedmen's disregard the problem of US citizens spending too much of their income on personal needs and desires. It doesn't seem likely to me, but we'll, we'll keep it around. The focus really was not on, you know, from either of the passages on spending too much of their income on personal stuff. Choice C, fail to understand that economic freedom is something that most U.S. citizens view as a right. Passage 2 really doesn't talk about economic freedom as a right. That's definitely an assumption by Passage 1, and neither does Passage 1 talk about how many citizens actually view it that way. Choice D, underestimate the extent to which economic freedom is threatened by high levels of taxation. 
this definitely seems to go against the grain of passage two because passage two is talking about the benefits of taxation. So would she say that economic freedom is threatened by high levels of taxation? This is a, a concern more of passage one, not of passage two. So that leaves us with A more likely, B less likely, but we'll keep it around. 21, which choice best provides the evidence? Choice A, lines 46 to 50, let's read it. Benefits that are provided reliably for long periods of time, such as clean water and stable currency system, tend to fade into the background and not to be considered benefits at all. Keep in mind the answers that we're trying to justify. We're either looking for evidence that passage two would say that the freedmen's ignore how much of the benefit people get in return for their tax dollars, or that the freedmen's disregard US citizens spending too much money. From what we just read, benefits that are provided for reliably long periods of time tend to fade into the background. That does seem to go along with choice A really well, and they go into the background and they're not to be considered benefits at all. For now, A seems to work in backing up choice A in question 20. Let's check the others, 57 to 59. This is easy to see. What's easy to see? The fact that these benefits can be remote and elusive. If we contrast government benefits with the benefits we receive from exchanges in the marketplace, this is a comparison between government benefits and benefits in the marketplace. Does it back up either of our choices? Does it show that people ignore the benefit that they receive? Or does it show that people spend too much money? Neither of these is really going on in those two lines. So we're gonna eliminate choice B, choice C, 59 to 62. And at this point, we can just keep reading. When we go to the store, we hand over our money, immediately get something very concrete in return, a candy bar, a blouse, some of the groceries. The sentence also doesn't really seem to be backing up either of those ideas. And then choice D is 62 to 63. This kind of exchange is very satisfying. We see what we get for our money right away. So you might think that either the previous sentence or the last one is backing up the second idea, but it's not really saying that Americans spend too much of their money on personal needs. It's really just talking about how satisfying it is to spend money on personal needs. All that adds up to choices C and D not being the best answers, and we'll stick with A.